My name is Alex Ellswick, and I'm a person in long-term recovery from an addiction to uh, prescription opioids and heroin. And uh, I was born and raised in Lexington, Kentucky, to a really happy, healthy home. I was never neglected. I was never abused. My parents didn't divorce. They didn't use drugs. They drink alcohol very infrequently. In fact, it's probably safe to say my dad hasn't had a drop of alcohol yet in 2019, um, just as a matter of choice. They just don't like it. And, and despite the fact that I grew up in this really uh, privileged, uh, ideal background, that couldn't change two really important things about who I was from the day that I was born. And the first is that I was born with the genetic predisposition for addiction. Um, my mom had seven uncles and four of them had drug and alcohol problems. And uh, that meant that from the day that I was born, I was more likely than the average person to have a, a problem with substances. And secondly, from the time that I was young, um, I've struggled with anxiety. And I've been diagnosed with a whole host of different anxiety disorders. Um, in fact, I started my professional career as a therapist. And I remember the first time I got a DSM-5, which is our diagnostic Bible in therapy, uh, I was flipping through the section on anxiety disorders and I was like, dear God, I'm a case study in this. I, they should have a picture of me in the anxiety disorders. So everything from garden variety, generalized anxiety disorder, um, to a very specific kind of anxiety disorder called trichotillomania, which is a hair pulling disorder. Um, so when I was in the seventh grade, I was so anxious uh, when I would, would take tests um, that I would sit and pluck at my eyebrows like this until they were completely gone. And I have a memory of going to family Thanksgiving in Ohio and uh, sitting across the Thanksgiving dinner table and my cousin Eric looking at me and looking at my mom and doing like a double take and being like, what happened to Alex's eyebrows? They're all gone, you know, and uh, embarrassed me to death. But, but the reason I share that is because, um, really two reasons. One, because in my profession, we think of anxiety disorders as internalizing disorders, so things that people can't see. And what's unique about trichotillomania is it's an anxiety disorder, but there's, it leaves some very real evidence that externalizes. Um, the lack of eyebrows on my face was evidence that something wasn't right inside, that I was having a really negative internal experience. And, and I think that's um, a lot of the reason why I spent much of my youth looking for ways to cope with high felt. Um, I sought it out in all sorts of different ways. And the thing that I found that worked the best was substances. Um, I don't remember the first time that I drank alcohol. I think I was probably 12 or 13. Um, I probably liked it because I drank plenty of times after that. And I virtually always drank to excess. Um, but I do remember the first time that I smoked marijuana and I never share my story of addiction and recovery without sharing about the first time that I smoked weed. Cause I think it's so critically important. I remember where I was, I remember who I was with, and I remember the song that was playing on the radio the first time that I smoked a joint in my buddy's truck. It was a ludicrous song called Blueberry Yum Yum. And the reason that I remember that is because it was such an important experience for me. Because up to that point in my life, everything I'd seen in pop culture, in the media, was people smoke marijuana and they get slap happy and silly and they act stupid. And that wasn't my experience at all. Um, I smoked marijuana and for the first time in 15 years on this planet, I just felt normal. I just felt okay. Um, my, my anxiety dissipated, my shoulders dropped, I felt calm, I felt comfortable, I didn't feel intoxicated, I just really felt normal. And uh, that very quickly became a feeling that I craved. And I, I genuinely believe that, that in that moment I developed a chemical relationship with drugs and alcohol. Because I learned this really powerful lesson. I can take a substance from outside my body and I can put it in my body and I can change how I feel. And there's an immense amount of power in having that at your fingertips. And I went on through high school really like a typical, like a typical kid. I think if you spoke to my classmates, um, none of them would have said, here's a kid who's going to have a problem with drugs and alcohol later in life. Um, I went to a public high school here in Lexington, Henry Clay High School. And I played golf and basketball and baseball at Henry Clay. I was a good student and a good athlete. And maybe as importantly as anything else, uh, I think a pretty good kid, whatever that means. I'm a rule follower. I'm very type A type of personality. So I don't like to, uh, to be in trouble. Um, and that's probably why my drug use should have presented another red flag that um, 
here's a guy who's able to follow the rules in every other aspect of his life except for this one. And, and I wish we had been more curious about that. Um, I, I got the chance to go to Center College to play baseball when I was 18. <clears throat> and um, I got into that freedom and that independence of being alone, being away from mom and dad. And I just started smoking an egregious amount of weed. Um, smoking all, all day, every day, eight, ten times a day. I was smoking weed before practice, before games, before, um, before exams. Um, and I think just really coping with an undiagnosed and therefore untreated anxiety that was, it was pretty much spiraling out of control. And, uh, and marijuana was the only thing at the time that I found that worked. Um, there's an old joke in 12 step programs. People say, uh, I didn't have a, a drug problem or an alcohol problem. What I had was a money problem because as long as I had enough money, it wasn't a problem. So we call that alcohol logic. And uh, I can, that resonates with me because um, I was continuing to make good grades and buy for a starting spot on this baseball team. So in my sort of deluded world, I believe that it wasn't a problem that I smoked all day. The only problem was that I was running out of money. And so I started selling drugs. And um, on Valentine's Day 2010, um, I got pulled over at 2 a.m. on a Friday, Friday night, Saturday morning, because uh, my brake light was out. And I got arrested on a whole litany of felony uh, drug trafficking charges. Trafficking eight ounces to five pounds, trafficking within a thousand yards of a school, possession of a controlled substance, possession of paraphernalia, a DUI, and they even charged me with failure to illuminate tail lamp, which felt like a big smack in the face on top of all the felonies. Um, and I've been really privileged since then that I've had the opportunity to have much of my record expunged. But I'll have you know that that taillight charge remains on my record to this day. Um, I went to jail, and jail was a really bad experience for me. And that maybe seems like a silly thing to say. I don't, I don't, I don't know what jail's supposed to be, but it was a bad experience for me. Um, when I got out of jail, um, I went to the baseball coach's office, and he kicked me off the team. I went straight out of his office into the dean of students' office, and the dean of students kicked me out of the college. And I have a distinct memory of walking across Center College's campus and crying my eyes out. Um, and the way the narrative went in my head at the time was, I've just made some really bad decisions. And, and at the time, I believed that. And that's, that's not something that I believe today, necessarily. Um, I got put on probation with a year on the shelf, which meant that if I violated the terms of my probation, I'd have to go serve a year. Uh, I just told you jail was a bad experience. So for the first time in my life, I was sincere about a desire to, to, to not use drugs and alcohol. And I didn't use words like sobriety or recovery because those were foreign concepts to me. Um, but I was so sincere about my desire not to use anything. And that went well for about two months. And then uh, I had elective oral surgery to have my wisdom teeth removed. It seemed like a sensible thing to do since I wasn't taking classes at the time, wouldn't have to miss any class. Um, and uh, following the surgery, I was prescribed oxycodone. There was no uh, screening, no assessing my history of mental illness or, or substance use, no assessment of risk, um, just got a prescription. And I took it as prescribed. I didn't abuse it. I didn't crush it up and snort it. I didn't take more than I was supposed to or take it more frequently than I was supposed to. Um, I took it as prescribed. And then I, I got dry sockets in all four of the wounds in my mouth. And so I was prescribed um, a second prescription for oxycodone. And again, I took it as prescribed, um, not, not abusing it in any way. Um, but it, it didn't matter. Um, for someone with the genetic predisposition and clinical anxiety and a long past history of substance use, I check all the boxes for the high risk category of developing a substance use disorder. And that is exactly what happened. Um, I got addicted. And it's a, it's a strange phenomenon to try to describe what it feels like becoming addicted. Because for me, it was so slow and so gradual and so insidious um, that all I know is when that prescription ran out, I ended up with about a, a 30 day supply of opioids. And when that prescription ran out, um, I felt irritable and depressed and extra anxious and, and uh, something just wasn't right. 
And at the time, I'm not even sure that I was consciously aware that it was uh, withdrawals, essentially. Um, I just knew, like, on a, on a cellular level, I knew that I needed to get my hands on some more of that, that medicine to make that feeling go away. And uh, fortunately or, or unfortunately at the time, in like the height of the opioid epidemic, there were uh, pills all over the street. So I started buying uh, oxycodone on the street. And um, I went from, from taking them orally to snorting them. And I woke up two years later with a $150 a day um, pain pill addiction. And, uh, you know, it's the, it's the strange nature of addiction. I, I got back into school. Center College was always really good to me. So I got back into school. They restored my scholarships. Um, I continued working on a degree. I was making good grades, um, but I was skipping classes to, to drive out of town to go buy pills. And, and um, when I used to tell my story five or six years ago, I used to, I used to give people this laundry list uh, of all these awful things that I did when I was addicted because I thought that's what I was supposed to do. Um, I thought I was supposed to stand in front of a room full of people and bear my soul and repent of my sins. And over time, I've learned that uh, nobody benefits when I do that. Um, the audience doesn't profit. I don't profit. No, nobody wins. It probably just further stigmatizes addiction. So I won't do that. But suffice it to say, I did, I did some awful things um, to support $150 a day pain pill addiction. Um, some awful things, things that I should be in prison for today, things that um, I'm deeply, deeply ashamed of. And um, I think because of the shame of some of those things, I finally went to my parents in uh, the fall of 2012. And I said, Mom, Dad, I, I have a problem. I can't stop taking these pills. And it, it came as an utter shock to my family. They had no idea that I'd been using pills. They thought that I'd made a mistake with marijuana and I was back in school and back on track and everything was fine. Um, so we were really unprepared as a family to address it. Um, I ended up getting a referral to treatment <clears throat> from a guy, my mom's a CPA and she was doing payroll for a restaurant in town. And so I ended up getting a referral to treatment from a restaurant manager. And the reason I share that is because if, <laughs> if I had cancer, if I had some other chronic disease, um, you better believe I wouldn't be getting referrals from the manager at the restaurant. But because addiction treatment isn't routinized into mainstream healthcare, that's, that's how I got my referral to treatment. So I entered this phase in my life where I started going to treatment centers. And um, first I went to a seven day detox in Nashville, Tennessee. And in my naivete, I, I believed that it would work like any other uh, dis disease or, or any other condition where I go to the hospital, I get treated and I walk out and I'm well. And so I did this seven day detox. It was miserable. It was horrible at the time. It was one of the worst things I ever did. And on the seventh day, uh, they let me go and I came back to Lexington and uh, we celebrated as a family. We went out to dinner and I was back in Lexington 12 hours and I relapsed. And uh, after an interlude and refusing to go to treatment for a while, um, and spending a few nights homeless in Lexington, um, I went back to treatment. This time I went for 30 days. I'm like, oh, okay, I get it. It's not just this, uh, this detox. I also need this therapeutic component, right? Um, CBT or 12 steps or whatever it was. And so I invested in that for 30 days. It was the longest 30 days of my entire life. At the time, it was the worst thing I'd ever done. And uh, I had a graduation at the end of the 30 days. Came back to Lexington. My family celebrated. We went out to dinner. Um, in fact, I, I came back on Valentine's Day and I took, uh, I made dinner for my girlfriend that night is actually what it was. Made dinner for her and we had a nice evening and then uh, I relapsed the next morning. And um, this is a cycle that repeated itself many, many times um, of going to treatment, celebrating a graduation, getting everyone's hopes up and coming out and relapsing. I went to um, four treatment centers in a span of a year. I spent every major holiday in treatment. And uh, eventually I gave up on treatment. Um, I just kind of became resigned to the fact that I was doing a lot of damage to my family, building everyone's hope every time I left to go to treatment. Um, I couldn't seem to, to make this thing work. So I just became resigned to the fact that I'm a person who's gonna use drugs until the day that I die. 
And um, the girl I was dating at the time uh, took a job in Cincinnati after she graduated from UK. And I moved to Cincinnati with her. And uh, I don't know what everyone knows about Cincinnati in the context of the opioid epidemic, but you can scarcely pick a worse place to go than Cincinnati, Ohio. So like moth to a street lamp, I found my way to Cincinnati. I got, I was in Cincinnati two weeks. I got reacquainted with a guy I met in treatment. Um, and uh, he introduced me to heroin and using a syringe. And, um, you know, I think in, in, with, in, in stigma and in stereotype, we, we like to believe that heroin addiction and IV addiction is so different from uh, snorting pills, prescription pills, or whatever it is, taking pills. It's really not. It's just, it's just a different, it's a, it's a little bit darker, it's a little bit heavier, but it's the same thing. It's the same Groundhog Day in hell, just over and over again. And um, I promised I wouldn't share all these awful things, but I often share one because it's just not graphic. Um, for one of our anniversaries, I'd given Lauren this um, Tiffany's bracelet. And uh, in August of 13, uh, she went to work one day and uh, I was in withdrawals and I was pretty sick. And I went into a room and I stole it and I pawned it for heroin. It was about a four or $500 bracelet. I'm sure I got about $80 for it. And um, <clears throat> when she realized what I'd done, she kicked me out. And, uh, and I went homeless. And I'd been homeless a few times before then. Usually when I would refuse to go to treatment, I'd stay a few nights at a shelter, sleep on someone's couch. You know, I'd been homeless in Nashville for a few weeks. Um, but this time I really had nowhere to go because my family wouldn't, um, wouldn't support me unless I was willing to return to treatment, which I wasn't. Um, and so I had just enough money to, uh, get one of these hotels, <laughs> one of these hotels where you pay by the two weeks, you know? So like if you're paying for a hotel by the hour or you're paying by the two weeks, it's generally not a great place to be. And, uh, you know, none of the folks who were there with me were there on a winning streak in their life. And uh, I would catch the tank, the, the bus that runs through Northern Kentucky um, from, from this hotel into Over the Rhine in Cincinnati. And this was before Over the Rhine was like gentrified and revitalized. And now it's like little hippie town where you go do go yoga and, and stuff like that. But back then it was just project housing. And um, me and this guy named Chris, who was about 40, 45 years old, Chris's son was addicted. Chris was addicted. The three of us would catch the bus go into Over the Rhine and cop some dope, go to this abandoned building across the street and shoot it up and take the bus back. And um, so that's kind of how I lived for, for the next month. And then uh, I ended up calling home and asking for help. And my parents said, you know, there's just not much we can do for you anymore. Uh, they are already dipping into their 401k and my sister's college savings to send me to treatment and it wasn't working. So so there's not much we can do for you, but they gave me some phone numbers. And one of the numbers they gave me was a guy named Aaron Mosley, who does a lot of work with folks who are homeless in Lexington. And uh, I called Aaron. He didn't know me from Adam. I said, Aaron, my name's Alex. I'm addicted to heroin. I need help. And he said, where are you? I told him I was in Cincinnati. He said, don't move. I'm coming to get you. And it was uh, midnight on a Monday night. And uh, he jumped in the car. He started driving up. He said, I want you to call me in 15 minutes so I know you're not going to run away. And uh, so I hung up the phone. 15 minutes went by. Uh, I shot a little bit of heroin. I called him. And uh, he said, all right, I'm, I'm on I-75. I'm on my way. Hang up the phone and call me in 15 minutes so I know you're not going to run away. So I hung up the phone. And I remember looking down at the bag of dope that I had left. Um, it was about a half a gram, which for me was about five times more than... Um, than I would typically use. And uh, it's like all of a sudden it just came crashing in what was about to happen. Um, I think in the panic to relieve the pressure of what I was feeling, I was willing to do anything, but all of a sudden I remembered, oh yeah, he's gonna take me to detox and that's gonna be miserable. And then he's gonna take me to treatment and that's gonna be miserable. And I'm gonna build everyone's hopes up and I'm gonna get out and I'm gonna relapse because um, that's what I do. And I didn't wanna do that. Um, so I took the half gram and I drew it up all at once and I shot it and I fell out and, um, 
I, I woke up to Aaron banging on the hotel room door, pissed off because I hadn't called him, and disappointed to be uh, awake. And I know that sounds that sounds so dramatic, but it's hard to describe what it's like to wake up and be disappointed to be alive, um, and and wish that you didn't have to go and, and live another day. Um, so Aaron took me back to Lexington. Uh, <laughs> to an even nastier hotel than I was already in, which is not pro providing a great deal of relief, and uh, detoxed me on his own. And it's funny because in my profession, we talk about evidence-based practices. This is certainly not an evidence-based practice. This is what we call the Aaron Mosley method. So Aaron got me some, some oxen on the street and, um, and some Nutter Butters. I don't know why Nutter Butters. That's just what we had. So I ate Nutter Butters, took, took the subs, and, uh, and sweated out. And Aaron does a lot of work. I told you, he does work with folks who are homeless. Um, so he hired this, this guy named Phil, who was homeless in Lexington, uh, to guard the door at the New Circle Inn so that I couldn't leave. And Phil loved to watch um, anime cartoons. Phil was like a 45 year old man, loved anime cartoons. So I spent a week withdrawing from heroin, uh, eating Nutter Butters, and watching uh, anime cartoons with Phil. And I don't know spiritually where I land. About heaven and hell, but I promise you, if there's a hell, it's it's a week at the at the New Circle Inn, uh, withdrawing from dope and watching anime cartoons. That was horrible. Um, when that week was up, Aaron came back to get me. He took me to uh, a Salvation Army in Dayton, Ohio, which is a place he'd gotten into recovery at a Salvation Army, and uh, it was a rude awakening because every place I've been to before, they were like really nice treatment centers. Um, they cost a lot of money out of pocket where they, you know, these pretty nurses come in every four hours and check your vital signs and rub your back and say, are you okay, honey? Can I get you anything? Comfort meds, whatever it was. Uh, not at the Salvation Army. Uh, Salvation Army was, you know, a free program and you had to work to earn your stay. So you, you took all the intakes, um, those big Salvation Army trucks, box trucks that drive around to pick up donations. We would process the donations and that's how we supported the treatment center. And, uh, I had to go sort of go back through withdrawals because I'd been using subs um, with Aaron, and um, I was just I was just so miserable um, that I left. I walked out the front door, and um, I ended up spending the next week uh, homeless in Dayton, uh, sleeping under a bridge under the uh, Highway 35 overpass in downtown Dayton, and uh, holding the cardboard sign that said homeless and hungry and digging through the trash can to get those free coupon codes off a of McDonald's receipt um, and shooting heroin. And um, I frequently tell people when, when you just imagine like, like a stereotype of heroin addiction, that was me, just, just a living, breathing stereotype. Uh, I was 50 pounds underweight. I looked a wreck. Um, and so I kept walking back to the Salvation Army, begging to get back in. And uh, day after day, they told me no vacancy, no beds, no beds. And, uh, and finally, one day, um, there was a bed, and they let me come back. And I stayed. And it's a miracle that I stayed, because for about 60 days, uh, every part of me wanted to leave. Because it's so miserable. There's just no reward early in recovery. It's just prolonged, sustained misery. And um, didn't talk to my family for those two months. I was just a ghost around that place. Um, and really, really slowly things started to change. Um, I remember waking up about 30 days sober at the Salvation Army. And I didn't feel great. I didn't even feel good. I just felt uh, okay, you know. I felt a lot like I imagine most people feel when they roll out of bed in the morning. Just really nondescript, nothing special about it. But for me... Uh, it was remarkable because it was the first time in five years that I woke up and I didn't feel anxious, and I didn't feel depressed, and I didn't feel ashamed of who I was or of whatever I'd done the night before to get my hands on my medicine. I just felt okay. And that was an incredibly hopeful moment for me when I was consciously aware that I was okay. And I ended up spending six months at the Salvation Army, which is a homeless shelter, really. Um, and it, those last three months were at that time the best the best three months of my entire life um, at a shelter in Dayton. 
and I just started to get my brain back. I started exercising, started getting my body back and, and started to feel human again. And I wish that, that if you spend six months at a treatment center, that that was enough, that, uh, that you could say you're healed, you're good to go. But when I left the Salvation Army, um, I faced a lot of the barriers that are characteristic of, of um, folks who are leaving active addiction. I had bad credit, I had lots of debt, I had a criminal record. Um, even though I qualified for Section 8 housing financially, I was disqualified by virtue of the fact that I had a drug trafficking charge. Um, I had no degree, I had huge gaps in my employment history, I was utterly unemployable, I had no skills, no education. I didn't know where I was going to live. My parents were really reticent to help in any way because they were working hard not to, to enable. And um, so I ended up, uh, there's a church in Lexington that my parents had attended called Crossroads Christian Church. And the pastor there let me sleep at the parsonage, the little church house, uh, for free for a few months until um, I got back on my feet. And uh, <laughs> it's funny because the other Folks who usually stay at the parsonage were like young seminary students. They were like straight out of seminary, very straight edge kids, really nice kids. Um, and I went from like jail to the street to treatment, like tattooed and filthy, filthy mouthed. And, and I think I scared those kids a little bit, but they were very nice to me. Um, I got my first job working in a tobacco field, uh, which is serious labor. Um, and, uh, and, and was sitting on the back of the truck one day smoking a cigarette and one of the guys I worked with said, well, what do you want to do? You don't want to be in a tobacco field forever. And to be honest, I was pretty happy to be in a tobacco field. I was pretty happy to be sober and be where I was. But I said, I think I want to go and, and help people who've been through what, I, what I've been through. Um, maybe I want to become a counselor. And so he said, oh, well, my wife is a professor at UK. She actually works in a department that has a counseling program. You should check it out. And so I did. Um, Totally ignorant about the process. I showed up for the interviews. I didn't even understand what it meant that it was a clinical program. It was clearly really competitive. There were a ton of people there interviewing. And um, for whatever reason, they gave me a chance. And uh, so I ended up getting a mass, finishing my bachelor's, getting a master's, doing family therapy. And, um, and now I'm working on a PhD. <clears throat> and I get to do the coolest stuff every day. Um, I get to help people doing research. Uh, really focusing on um, what people need to sustain recovery. Most of my research focuses on young people, emerging adults, 18 to 25 year olds in recovery. Um, and when I was about two or three years in recovery, um, in about 2016, um, my mom and I realized that uh, there wasn't a lot of Narcan availability in the community. And so we started, um, writing grants and trying to get a hold of, of some Narcan to distribute the community. We started giving talks just to raise awareness and try to change the community's perspective a little bit on addiction and recovery. We met a professor at UK named um, Amanda Fallon Bennett. And Amanda had started her, her career working at a syringe exchange in San Francisco and just found that she had a heart for people in addiction and recovery. And, um, and so we started doing some really grassroots work and then formalized um, into what is today Voices of Hope. And what we are is a, a recovery community organization, which means that um, we advocate for people in recovery, uh, we provide education, we provide recovery support services to help people sustain long-term recovery. Essentially, we know that addiction is a chronic disease, so what people need is a, a chronic ongoing management of their disorder. So we provide peer-delivered services that help people, and we get to do the coolest things in the world uh, yesterday, there were people here getting free haircuts and recovery and eating pizza. And uh, our center serves as a hub for all things recovery in the city. It's, uh, it's the coolest thing in the world. And I got involved with Kentucky SOS um, in part really just to provide um, a perspective as a patient advocate. Because one of the things that, that I recognize in retrospect is that there's no one person to blame for my addiction. I don't blame physicians. I don't, I don't blame uh, my family. I don't blame myself. I don't even blame Purdue Pharma. Um, it's a nasty, perfect storm. But I do know that there are lessons that I've learned um, that can help other people. Um, some ways that we can prevent someone else from going through what I've gone through. And um, if, we can, if we can keep one person from having to experience what I experienced, then we've done something right.